Now, when I think of the main messages that we're getting from Ephesians, is that by believing in Jesus, God has made us different. And the difference is not slight, it's enormous. And the application of this message is be what God has made you to be. Don't be any less than that. Now this is a challenge considering the word that world that we live in. We usually describe the world as a dark place. And what Paul is talking about this morning is being children of light. Now, this world does not like light. When we start talking about being children of light in a dark world, that is a challenge. And we're gonna see this morning that the world doesn't like Christians and we're gonna see why. And we're gonna see what Paul's response is. He would say, be the solution to the problem, don't be the problem. So let's read Ephesians 5 beginning in verse eight. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For to whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says... Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, Paul <clears throat> is giving us reasons why we should not be partakers with the sons of disobedience. And that's as much as to say why we can't be like the rest of the world around us. We've already seen two reasons. One is, is that we're children of God. He says in the very first verse here in chapter five, be imitators of God as dear children. You know, children are supposed to take after their parents. They have to. There's that genetic inheritance. And so we are children of God. And the sons of dis disobedience are not. They are not persuadable. They refuse to listen. Huge difference there already. The second reason not to be like them, not to partake with them, not to share with the sons of disobedience, is that in verse six, the wrath of God comes upon them. And he says, anyone who does these works of darkness, the wrath of God is going to fall on them. So he says, don't share with them or you're going to share in their punishment. Now we have a third reason. We can't share with the sons of disobedience because we are completely opposite to them. And he says, you used to be like them. There in verse eight, he says, for you were once darkness. You used to be darkness if you're a believer in Jesus. Nobody started out light and in fellowship with God and perfect. The only one who's ever done that is Jesus from the womb. All the rest of us, we had nothing to do with the light whatsoever. And that's the only way to be dark, right? Now, Mark wanted to have some ambience in here maybe for the worship time, so he closed the drapes. Problem was, it got dark. Oh, we need a little light. And as soon as you let the light in, it destroys the darkness. You can't exist Together, you can't have, well, a little bit of dark and a little bit of light. All you end up having is a little bit of light. So, he says now, you are light in the Lord. And that's because of the very nature of God. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. It's a good way to conceive of God because light is absolute. 
It is. And that's what God says. I am. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, that it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God entered our darkness and he gave us the light of the knowledge of Jesus. We get to know who God is because of Jesus. And now, our lives shine with this light. Now, some teach that this light is reflected, like when the sun shines on the moon and we get to see that light. And it's only lit as it's lit up by the sun. And I've heard that teaching before. Have you ever heard that teaching before? And when I thought about it, that isn't quite right. That doesn't express what Paul's talking about here. Now, in the Old Testament, Moses spoke with God. And because of that close fellowship and communion, his face glowed when he walked down off the mountain after the second time of being up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He says, hi, guys. And they all ran away from him because he was unaware that he was glowing. And so what he had to do was sort of cover up and wear a veil and just not to freak people out. But in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says the other reason for Moses doing that was that it would fade because that glory was reflected. But what we have in the new covenant is greater than what Moses experienced. That is, we don't reflect that light. But instead, God puts the light in our hearts. It's not something external and not part of us. It's who we are. It is his life in us, and therefore that light is in us. And Paul goes on to say, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That light of the knowledge of God is in us now. Come on in. You can sit down. See, now everybody's looking at you. Just walk in, sit down. All right? The light is in us. You are light in the Lord. Now he says, because you're light in the Lord, because God has made you to be this, now live as light. Be what God has made you. Now, he talks about, in verse 9, the fruit of the Spirit. Some of your Bibles have the fruit of the light, depending on which text tradition your Bible has done. The newer Bibles go with what is called the critical text, and it'll have what are some of the earlier readings, and the earlier reading would be the fruit of the light. Some of you have a Bible based on Textus Receptus. And that will have a later reading, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this is one of those things that happens because, you know, they didn't have photocopiers 2,000 years ago. Nor did they have computers or presses. Any way to reproduce this stuff, they, of course, they did it by hand, and they wrote out manuscripts. And in the doing of that, sometimes you can have... Um, what are known as transmission errors. It turns out in the Bible that transmission errors in the manuscripts really don't amount to much because of the, the sheer weight of the numbers of the manuscripts. They can easily find what are the variant readings. And of all the variant readings in the entire Bible, they have virtually no effect on any of the doctrine. Now, if your Bible says fruit of the light, Fantastic. If it says fruit of the Spirit, bingo, because they are one and the same. That light dwelling in you is the life of God communicated to you by the Holy Spirit. There is no difference. So, notice that this life in the Spirit bears fruit. Fruit comes from living things. Did you know that? You know, I'm just 
starting over reading the Bible again. I finished up in Malachi on one night, and I'd only read a couple of chapters, so I started over again in Genesis. That's what I do. I just read through the Old Testament, and when I come to the very end, I just start right over. Usually it's the next night, but on this particular night, I didn't read enough. So I said, okay, I'm going to get Malachi and Genesis in a night. And I started over again. And I'm reading about creation. And it gripped me that when God made plants, he specified that they would have their seed in them. Plants were made by God to have the ability to reproduce in them. And if you think about it, he made everything that's alive with that capability, with maybe the exception of viruses and bacteria. But maybe not. They all reproduce themselves. Everything has its seed in it. And that means that God gave thought to reproduction. Yes, I'm going to create these things, but I also want them to reproduce and make more like them. That's one of the intrinsic things about life. Life begets life. And not only life, but more life. And when, the, when the plant lets those seeds go, those dandelion seeds, you don't get just one more dandelion plant. It takes over the whole backyard without even you trying. A nice, healthy crop of dandelions. Or wheat, or anything. It results in way more. Light results, life results in way more life. And the idea of life is very valuable. Valuable results. That's what comes of the Holy Spirit living in us. That's the fruit that comes from the light of God. Now, because we're born of the Holy Spirit, this new life in us brings valuable things. Paul says, goodness, righteousness, and truth. This is what comes out of our lives now because the life of God and the light of God is in us. And because we're children of light, it consists in all goodness, all righteousness, all truth. Now, that's what life is about, says God. Now, I didn't ask permission to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Probably easier to get forgiveness than permission. But again, Mark and Lizzie have been trying to furnish their house, and here's the problem. They bought a mattress. And when the mattress came, they laid on it, and it was as hard as a rock. They didn't last one evening on it. They said, whoa, we made a mistake. We need to take this thing back. So they called up the place they got it from, and they said, we need to do this. And they say, okay, well, you need to find out which one you want. So they went there. They found out which one they want. They said, okay, this is the one we want. They said, okay, it's going to cost this much more. Well, we got to have it. So they paid that much more. Then they got a receipt in the mail. Yes, we have your money. Great. Where's the mattress? We're going to send that in September. And, you know, their countenance fell because they said, wait a sec, we paid the money. We've got a deal here. What do you mean we're going to get it September? September which year? You know, and... It was sort of an outrage to think, okay, you've got our dough. Where's your end of the deal? So think of a whole life with things like that. Like you do what's right, but then you don't get what's right back. Life is a drag when instead of goodness, it's wickedness. Instead of righteousness, it's unfairness. Instead of truth, it's lies. <laughs> That's not what life's about. So Paul says, this is what life is about, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Because what's acceptable to the Lord is all righteousness, all goodness, all truth. 
That's what he says right there. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now, what he does not mean is, well, go out there and sort of trial and error as if God said, okay, I'm going to leave you in the dark and hope you figure it out. He didn't leave us in the dark. He's given us his word. And everything we need for goodness, righteousness, truth, it's all in here, in black and white. So what Paul means by finding out really means putting it to the test by experience and finding out that everything that God says is true. It means to approve it because you know by experience that it works. So, as we do what God says, all goodness, all righteousness, all truth We shine. God's glorified in our lives. Now, walking in all goodness and all righteousness and all truth means we cannot have fellowship with darkness. We can't be like everybody else around us. And you notice there's a big difference. In our lives, we've got the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of light, any way you want to put it. But he says in verse 11, have no one fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, what's coming out in your life is fruit. It's the result of life. But he says, what they're doing is works. It's just deeds. It's not the life. It's just, this is what they're doing. There's no fruit produced in darkness. Darkness. Plants need light to grow. Life needs light. You need light. You know that even the electricity that we're using to cool our food, heat the house, you know, use our fabulous iPods and all that stuff, do you know that it comes from light? That is, thousands of years ago, all those plants were photosynthesizing taking in the energy from the sun, storing it as starches. Then the flood came, buried everything, turned it into heat, compressed pockets of vegetable matter that it was rotting, turned it all into oil, petroleum. All that stuff they take out, refine it, use it to run turbines, get your electricity together, and it means that everything you have and that runs electricity, runs on light, which is stored up and packed away for a couple thousand years, and now you get to use it. But you run on light. If the sun were to blow up, eight minutes later, everything on earth would stop. The atmosphere would just go, um, the temperatures would just drop like a rock and would all die. All of our life is based on light. Okay, well, what happens when there's no light? There's no life. There's no fruit. There is no fruit in the works of darkness. No valuable results. What are the good results of adultery? What are the good results of pornography or homosexuality? Where's the fruit? Or lying? Who gets the benefit? The answer is nobody. Whatever is made in the dark is going to burn when this world is judged. Now Paul goes on to say that these unfruitful works of darkness are shameful. He says it's so shameful you can't even talk about it. And shame is this painful emotion that a person feels when he knows he's wrong, when he knows he's not fitting. You know, it's a formal dinner. Everybody's wearing a tuxedo. You show up just like I'm dressed right now. In a certain context, this is honorable. This is my folk costume in the country that I come from. But if I were to go to a a really formal dinner and everybody's in tuxedos and I walk in like this, I'd get a red face and I'd walk clean out and it would be painful. 
Now, the reason these things are shameful is because the works of darkness are not right. And the reason we know they're not right is that they're done in secret. It's shameful to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Why are they done in secret? Because they don't want people to know. Okay? So, that means that people know that if they were to have their deeds brought out into the open so that everybody could see it, everybody would say, that's wrong. You're wrong to do that. So instead of undergo that, they just do it in secret. Hey, nobody finds out? Not a problem. But what happens when people are caught? And they are caught. What about pedophiles? They get caught. And their face is put in the paper. And the whole trial is written up about. What happens then? Shame. And everybody says, that's wrong. Why? Who wants a pedophile on your block? You want one little next to you? Or a sex offender? Or a thief? If you know that the neighbor was a registered criminal with one of those things they got to wear in their legs to track where they are at all times, would you feel comfortable about that? Your very reaction says, you're wrong. So that's why these things are done in secret. Now here's a question. If people saw what you do in secret, what would they say? Would they say, wow, well done? Or would they say, shame on you. You're wrong. So Paul says, you know what? You can't be like them. You're in no way like them. And so don't be like them. Instead of sharing with them, he says, tell them that they're wrong. You notice that? He says, rather expose them. And I don't think he means like tattletales. Like we find out something and then go to the newspaper and blab it. I think it's just this sort of natural thing. We live in a dark world and we come into contact with everybody who says, this is right. And this is what people do. You know, they, they make white to be black. They say good is bad. Everything is backwards. And they say, you know what? That's right. The world wants to put out the light because in the dark, everything's the same. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. It's just, hey, live and let live. Just don't let it spill over into my life. But hey, everybody's okay, right? I'm okay, you're okay. I was a multi-million seller. Now, the reason for that kind of tolerance is that people actually hate the light. In John chapter three, Jesus said, and this is the condemnation, the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practices evil, practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That's the real reason for liking the dark. It's just it doesn't expose anybody. Nobody wants to be exposed any more than the next guy. So let's just live and let live and everybody's okay. Just don't let it spill into my life. Well, Paul says, reprove them. Don't agree with them. Now, reprove means to find fault with openly. It's like when everybody is talking on the job about, you know, wasn't it great to get all smashed last night and the way we did that and the party and I can't hardly think now, but wasn't it great? Wasn't that great? What do you say? You say, that's, no, that's not great. That's sinful. Did you hear that sound? That was the sound of the poop hitting the fan. That was the sound of, what do you mean? Who do you think you are? 
You know, all of a sudden, there's going to be a conflict. You know, you're going to be in good company when you do that. Did you know that Paul reproved openly? You can read his letters. 1 Corinthians is full of it. He says, now in this next thing that I'm going to talk to you about, I do not praise you. And he tells them what they're doing. And he says, what shall I say then? Shall I praise you for this? I do not praise you. Paul is right in their face saying, what you are doing is wrong. Don't you get it? Now, you know, it takes a lot of courage to write a letter like that. Is that truly a letter designed to win people and influence them? He says, have I become your enemy for telling you the truth? But he was faithful to tell him the truth. You know, not only are you going to be in good company with Paul, you're going to be in good company with Jesus. You know, there was a feast on in Jerusalem and his brothers were about to go up there and he says, hey, aren't you going up there too? Aren't you trying to get yourself known? You know, nobody who's trying to get themselves famous does things in a corner and you have to get out in front of people. He says, you go up. I'm not going up just yet. Your time is always at hand. My time is not at hand. And this is what he says to them. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. So Jesus was well aware that being the light of the world, he was in conflict. He was ruffling feathers there. He felt the contradiction of sinners when his very conduct showed them that they're wrong. Now, this conflict draws the line and enables everybody to be who they are. It's a necessary thing, this conflict. This calling a spade a spade and just saying, you know what, this is wrong. For one thing, the conflict is good for you. It really enables you to live who you are. It sort of forces the issue. Have you ever worked at a job and they don't know you yet? You just started and suddenly you do something that sort of outs you in a Christian way. You leave your Bible on the desk and somebody walks by and you have just, you know, raised your colors flown your flag, and now they know, okay, you're one of them, are you? You have just declared yourself. Well, you know what? That's good. That's a protection for you to be who you are and not cover it up. There's an old saying that there's no such thing as a secret disciple. Either the disciple will break the secret or the secret will break the disciple. You know what? Peter was being secret agent disciple, warming his hands at the fire with the very people that took away Jesus. And they said, are you one of them? And he said, no, I'm not. No, I saw you with them. You're one of them. You're accident. No, I'm not. You're one of them. No, I'm not. Great. Butimus. He wet out, went out and wept bitterly. You know what? The secret broke him. And the very same thing happens to us if we don't just come out in the open and go right into this situation and say, this is who I am. And, you know, when you come out, people will hold you to it. They say, well, wait a minute, I thought you were a Christian. I don't, Christians don't do that, do they? I think I've told you the time that I uh, found an unsmoked cigarette on my desk one time at work. And everybody else smoked cigarettes, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a toy cigarette. And I stuck it in my mouth, and then I go like this. Because, see, when you have it in here like this, 
the smoke gets in your eye, and they all walk around like this until they stick it on this side, and they walk around like this. So I went around like that, just pretending it was lit, but it wasn't. Like this, just like everybody else. And they looked at me, and they said, what are you doing? You know, my cigarette. Well, take that out of your mouth. I go, it's not lit. I just, I'm playing with it. It's my toy cigarette. They go, that's weird. Don't do that. I go, wait a minute. You smoke like a chimney. What's the deal? But see, the deal was, they knew I was a Christian. And it was kind of like a baby smoking. It's like, get it out of its mouth. What you, who let them have that? Right? It's weird. It's ugly. It's like a baby. Give me that. If you're old enough, I'd spank your bottom right to the moon. But on a Christian, it doesn't seem to fit. It's weird. See, they're going to hold you to it. So I said, hey, not lit. So I'm just playing with them. I'm just like you. They didn't like me just like them. That part didn't fit. It was weird. Okay, they're going to hold you to it, but then what about them? See, it's going to show up who they are too. Now remember, everybody you work with is a nice guy. They're all nice. They're all good guys. You ask them, are you a good guy? They go, yeah, sure, I'm a nice guy. I'm a good guy. Every single person you ask is going to tell you that. Okay, now, put you next to them, a real live walking Christian. And behold, they become snarly, cruel, vindictive, gossipy, nasty. Only because you're working there and you drive them nuts. Have you noticed that? Have you ever experienced that? Working on a job, working with people, all of a sudden it's like, man, I, I feel the coldness here. You're the one that sank the Titanic, am I correct? What's going on there? Well, as you're being light, all goodness, all righteousness, all truth, guess what? They can feel it. And they know that what they're experiencing is true goodness. They've never felt anything like that before. And it's disturbing because they're good. Only their good isn't like your good. And in comparison with your goodness, their goodness is nothing. It shows them plainly that they're not good. Now, they want to be good. But they want to be good their own way, without God. Don't want God. Get out of my face. Don't tell me anything about it. I don't want any light whatsoever. I want to stay in the dark. But there you are, just being yourself, just being good. And it calls out hostility. Guess what? They're not nice. They're not good at all. They are sons of disobedience. They are unpersuadable. They are hard as a rock. And it's only because you showed up. It's your fault. Nope. I'm just walking around being me. You've got a problem with God. See that? So, you're saying, boy, I have to rebuke the world, huh? And Paul says, yeah. That's what you're going to end up doing. You know, I don't like that job. I don't like it at all. I want to be liked. I want to be part of the guys. I want to fit in. But Paul says, you can't do that and be a child of light at the same time. It isn't going to work. Because they got everything backwards and you got everything forwards. How are you going to mix it? And he says there's really only one thing to do. And that's in verse 14. Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You can't be like everybody else. Everybody else is just dreaming. And they're hoping. They're hoping that nothing's going to happen. They're hoping that Jesus isn't coming back. They're hoping there's going to be no judgment. They're hoping that they're not going to get caught, that they're going to just get through life and have everything go their way and nothing go anybody else's way and nothing's going to happen. And you know what? They're dreaming. 
The world is not going to end like that. The world is going to end with every person getting caught. The world is going to end with everybody's picture blown up as big as the universe and all the papers, everybody's going to know the shameful things that were done in secret. Everybody's going to get caught. And Paul says, you know what? Don't be like them. He says, wake up. And you know what? It means wake yourself up. The, the language says it's not something somebody's going to shake you awake like, hey, you're late for work. Get up, get up. The thing is, wake yourself up. Get yourself going. Don't be dreaming anymore. You see, he says now is not the time to sleep. This is what he says in Romans 13. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wear him like a t-shirt. You know how you wear a t-shirt so that everybody knows you're wearing the cool t-shirt? Put them on. Make sure everybody can tell that you're one of them. And just let the hammer fall. And what it says there is that Christ will give you light. You think, boy, by myself, I can't do this. Martin Luther thought the same way. They asked him at the Diet of Worms when he was there to you know, defend his 95 theses there in front of the emperor, in front of the pope's representative, in front of everybody. It was the entire world against Martin Luther and they were saying to him, so what you're telling us is that you're right and everybody else and all the popes and all the councils and everybody who's ever lived is wrong. Is that what you're telling us? And he said... You bet. You're all wrong. Now that took guts. And you know what? It took him a day to get that answer. Because he said, give me some time. And he went back and he prayed all night. He couldn't sleep. Because this is really the answer of answers. As soon as he opens his mouth and says, you're wrong, you know what? He's a dead man. And he prayed and he prayed And he prayed. And he got back up and he came back in the very next day and he said, here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. If I'm dead, I'm dead. You're all wrong. He says, unless you can show me from Scripture that I'm wrong, you're wrong. You know, he changed the course of history right there. One guy. Let it shine. And so you know, this is it. Christ will give you light. That makes the difference. Without that light, you can't stand. You're not sufficient. So he says, awake. And you know, nothing wakes me up as much to realize that the end of the world is approaching. That's the thing that really makes me shake myself and say, okay, Rob, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? What are you messing around with on the internet? What are you wasting your time on? What are the priorities? Knowing that, I want to say, okay, give me light. You know what? The promise here is that Jesus will give us light. And that light is all that we need in this darkness. Jesus got this message from Mary and Martha in Bethany. Lazarus is sick. You got to come. And he waited a couple of days and he says, okay, guys, we're going back. 
And they said, are you kidding? They just tried to kill you there. And are you going back? And he says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, if we live as children of light, we're going to have conflict all around. We can't get away from that. But if we let Christ shine on us and receive that light, we don't have to worry about stumbling. We don't have to worry about is it dangerous? Because we get to see the light of the world. And even if, even if we lose our jobs, it's a possibility. There's such a thing as constructive dismissal. Or, you know, lose our lives. That's about as bad as it gets. We still have done the right thing. We've got the courage to say, you know what? Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Whatever it is, we're not going to walk in darkness. Amen? Let's pray. We want to thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have made us to be children of light. And Lord, we understand how difficult it is to stand up, to say that that is wrong, to write that letter into the parliament, just to come out to be known as who we are. Not because we have a finger to point at everybody and just go around looking down our noses, but just because we have to say the truth in love. We don't like that conflict. But we pray that you would shine upon us and give us that light so that we can be true even as Jesus was true. So that we dispel the darkness and the darkness does not overpower us. Help us to say that white is white, black is black, right is right, and wrong is wrong. In those times that we faltered, we kept our mouth shut, we were just quiet. We didn't agree with it, but we just didn't say anything. Lord, please forgive us. And wash us. And make us to live as children of light. We pray for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.